Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening and for letting us into your homes. We are still doing this NCAR Explorer series from our own houses this evening. And my name is Lorena Medina Luna. I am an education and outreach specialist at NCAR and the lead organizer for these NCAR Explorer series. And today we're very excited to offer this lecture, which is Seeing the Atmosphere Through Machine Learning with Dr. David John Gagne. Today we'll be using Slido, which allows you to join in the conversation by typing in your questions, voting up questions. If you see that little thumbs up, that's the question that you are also interested in. You can upvote that question. And you can also take um, part of some polls. And we do have an active poll right now, um, which is gonna be a word cloud that we'll show once I introduce the speaker and right before he gives his lecture. So go ahead and scroll down to your page to participate through Slido. Helping us today, um, Aliyah and Dan will be using the Slido interface to take your questions and I'll just be hosting um, and introducing our speaker. So NCAR, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research, it's a leading world organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the Earth system and the sun, located in Boulder, Colorado, but today again brought to you um, this lecture to you from our homes. Today's speaker is Dr. David John Gagne. He is a machine learning scientist in the Computational Information Systems Laboratory, or CISL, and the Research Applications Laboratory, or RAL, at NCAR. His research focuses on developing machine learning systems to improve the prediction and understanding of high impact weather and to enhance weather and climate models. During his time at NCAR, he has collaborated with interdisciplinary teams to produce machine learning systems to study hail, tornadoes, hurricanes, and renewable energy. He has also developed short courses and hackathons to provide atmospheric scientists hands-on experience with machine learning. Dr. Gagne received his PhD in meteorology from the University of Oklahoma in 2016 and completed the Advanced Study Program Postdoctoral Fellowship at NCAR in 2018. In addition to his duties at NCAR, he also serves as a chair of the American Meteorological Society of America Artificial Intelligence Committee. So there's a lot going on and I'm really excited for us to hear more about his work today. And one of the questions that we had from our word cloud, Dan, if we have some participants for the word cloud, can you put up the results? Because we're interested in knowing in your everyday life, what are some things that use machine learning? Google is the biggest one. <laughs> I search a lot. Um, we have satellites, modeling, cell phones, iPhone, weather prediction, which is um, some of the things we'll be talking about today. Maybe recommended news. Yeah, so how is all of this machine learning interacting in our lives? So cars are also one and deep learning. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. David John Gagne for your talk today. And we will be taking questions at the end of the lecture. So hold on to those questions because he might talk about them as we go through tonight. Dr. Gagne. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides here. Okay. Does everything look good? Oh, awesome. So again, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. David John Gagne. Uh, tonight I'll be talking about seeing the atmosphere through machine learning. Uh, as was evidenced by the word cloud, uh, machine learning is everywhere. It's now embedded in our everyday lives. Uh, as evidenced by the word cloud, we saw a lot of responses about people seeing machine learning in Google, and Siri, on their phone, on their smart speaker. Uh, one thing I didn't see as much was um, machine learning is actually now in your car. So uh, we are in the Boulder, Greater Boulder area. So a lot of people have Subarus and a lot of Sub all the Subarus now have this eyesight camera so they can actually monitor the road and it uses machine learning 
to to spot the lines on the road and make sure you don't drive off a cliff, for instance. Uh, machine learning also helps drones fly uh, so they don't uh, veer off in some crazy direction and keeps them stable and allows them to do those crazy formations that you see at like the Super Bowl halftime show. Uh, we even see machine learning now at the grocery store. Uh, Walmart uh, in this example is using uh, uh, machine learning vision to keep track of all of the potato chip bags and other items in their store so that when something runs out, uh, someone can come and immediately refill it. Uh, behind the scenes, machine learning plays a huge role in our modern economy. Uh, a lot of companies use machine learning to predict uh, when certain goods are needed so they can order more of them. And whenever you make an order on Amazon, uh, these robots will, will work in the Amazon distribution center and bring the shelves to the employees to, to pick the items off and uh, box them up and send them on your way. Uh, these are just a few examples of the myriad uses of machine learning. Uh, in tonight's talk, I want to focus on first, how does machine learning work? Uh, we kind of assume it's just this big black box, but really under the hood, it's, there's a lot of relatively straightforward concepts underlying it. Uh, since, since I'm in weather, I want to talk about how machine learning can help us forecast extreme weather with examples focusing on hailstorms and hurricanes. Uh, towards the end, we'll talk about what are some of the challenges associated with machine learning, and as well as what can machine learning learn about the atmosphere. So first, what is machine learning? Uh, to provide some context, I wanted to define a few terms surrounding machine learning. Uh, because it's easy to get confused with AI and machine learning and deep learning uh, and robots and all, all, these, all these different pieces. So first, uh, I wanted to define artificial intelligence, which kind of encompasses a, a large part of the field. It is now kind of a catch-all term for methods for computer systems to perform human tasks, whether that be playing chess or uh, answering questions from, from someone on your phone or recommending a movie or uh, predicting the weather. There are a lot of ways to, to accomplish artificial intelligence. One of them that, uh, that was popular, especially back in the 1980s, was something called expert systems. Uh, the idea behind this is that you ask the expert uh, a bunch of questions about how they make their decisions, and then you write that up into a computer program, and then you just run the computer program. Uh, and this works pretty well in very focused situations, but because their experts don't entirely know how they're doing the things they do, uh, we couldn't write down all the rules to do that. So a lot of people started working more on machine learning, uh, which is a computer system that learns to perform tasks by reviewing large amounts of data. Essentially, you, you, you have a large amount of data where you have some kind of example uh, of something the machine learning model would see, and then you have what the outcome should be. And you, you, you show it the, the input, the, the view of the scene, uh, you see what it does, and if it doesn't do the right thing, you penalize it, uh, and then you repeat this process a bunch of times, and eventually the machine learning model learns what to do. Uh, and when I say model, uh, model is another term for kind of a focused computer program. Uh, you have machine learning models, we have uh, weather prediction models that are based on physics and equations. Uh, they're, they're both computer programs, but, but are kind of have different con constructs with them. Uh, within machine learning, we also have deep learning, which has gotten a lot of hype in the past uh, five years or so. Uh, deep learning is a, a subset of machine learning that focuses on neural networks with multiple specialized layers. Uh, and these specialized layers focus on learning spatial and temporal information and other kinds of structure and data. Uh, deep learning has really led to a lot of the big advancements in things like computer vision, uh, like recognizing faces and cats and dogs, uh, and also tying like machine translation and lots of other applications we'll talk about in the talk. What do you need to build a, one of these machine learning systems? Uh, first, uh, the most important step is making a well-defined problem. Uh, it's easy to just say, I want to do machine learning for uh, X thing, but 
if, if you don't define the problem well, you will not get a good solution. So the first question to ask is, what is the goal? What are you actually trying to do outside of just build a machine learning model? Are you trying to uh, predict tornadoes well in advance? Are you trying to uh, get your package to from from Amazon to your house in a day? Uh, what what is the, what is the goal? Uh, what data are available? Uh, like how, how big of a data set is, is already available? How long does it go back in time? What is the coverage of the data? What are the constraints? Do you, do you need a prediction now? Do you need it in a week? Do you, uh, how, how big of a computer do you have to run? Is it a phone or is it a supercomputer? How is the performance judged? Uh, it, it, what kind of error metric are you, are, are you being compared against? Uh, do you need to do really well on one certain case or, or are you looking at how you do on average? Uh, and then what is the current approach? If it's an important problem, someone's already solving it somehow and there's probably some issues with that. So can we overcome those with machine learning? Next, you actually need a data set. Uh, most of our machine learning data sets look like some kind of data table. Uh, we have metadata, which is uh, data that's not used in the prediction directly, but describes it. That can be things like uh, a date, uh, a location, a uh, time, uh, a person's name. Uh, we also have inputs in the weather field. This would be things like temperature, pressure, wind, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, it could be a picture of, uh, 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 of a person's car. Uh, and then the output is what we're actually trying to predict. So if we're trying to predict hail, we have a yes or no on hail. Uh, it could be some, it could be something else like uh, what color is the car. We have candidate and machine learning models. So there's usually more than one machine learning model that might fit the problem. So we pick a few that seem suitable and we test them out and pick the best one. Uh, before we kind of get to the present of machine learning research, I wanted to dive back into a bit of history of machine learning. Uh, even though a lot of the hype for machine learning is, has really uh, built up in the past decade, uh, the, hit, the underlying concepts that drive machine learning date back decades. Uh, the first kind of neural network uh, predecessor was uh, Rosenblatt's uh, Perceptron. Uh, here's a picture of, of the computer uh, that was underlying in, in Rosenblatt back in the 1950s. Uh, and got into the 1960s, we had some further developments and in, in the initial uh, push for machine learning research with things like the first tic-tac-toe machine and the development of the nearest neighbor algorithm. In the 70s, we had the first AI winter when machine learning funding was drastically cut uh, and, and a lot of the excitement of the initial uh, hype of machine learning research died down. Uh, during this time period, though, research continued and we had things like the first multi-layer neural networks, which is the kind of the forerunner to our modern deep learning uh, happened back in the 70s. In the 80s, we had another explosion of machine learning research. In particular, we had the, the, the first uh, decision tree systems were developed as well as expert systems that I had described earlier um, and convolutional neural nets, which are which we'll discuss more in, in detail later, but those are the, the systems that are now underscoring our computer vision, uh, any kind of, I might say computer vision, that's like recognizing images. Uh, so, so say looking for cats and dogs. Uh, th this was first developed in the 80s, but it really didn't reach its promise until, until more recently. Uh, in the 90s, we had the development of something called a random forest, which we'll describe more in detail later, but it's an uh, ensemble of decision trees. Uh, we also had things like computer-aided cancer detection and uh, we had uh, Deep Blue, uh, which was the computer program that beat uh, Grandmaster Gary Kasparov in chess uh, pretty famously. In 2000s, uh, we had machine learning research continued. We had the first paper that actually called it deep learning in 2006. Uh, we also had a, a, a number of competitions set up around test, testing out the potential of AI. The most uh, important of these was the ImageNet competition. Uh, that, that, that basically uh, created data, data sets of millions of images and to have a, 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 a benchmark for all the different uh, uh, teams around the world that are working on machine learning for uh, identifying things in images to, to compare their methods against. Uh, 
We also had the development of things like GPUs and the iPhone that were really important for uh, the basically the deep learning revolution. So, so we're, we're in the 2000s. A lot of the building blocks for, for machine learning had already been developed, but they had to come together. And in, in the 2010s, this is when we, we saw a lot of the big advances. Uh, in the ImageNet competition in 2011, we ha had the first convolutional neural network model that could perform 10% better than uh, all the other machine learning methods tried before then. And that basically really kicked off the, uh, the, uh, the interest in machine learning and uh, you saw, started seeing a lot more corporate investment. Uh, just a few years later, uh, Facebook unveiled their first uh, facial recognition system. Uh, and a couple of years after that, we had AlphaGo, which is a, a deep learning AI uh, system that played the game Go and defeated the top Go player in the world, Lee Seidel, uh, shown in this picture right here uh, in 2016. Uh, based off a lot of kind of interest curves and things like Google searches and stuff, the AlphaGo and kind of some of the machine translation work that like Google was releasing at this point with machine learning, uh, and, uh, the hype really started like like skyrocketing right around this time. Uh, since then, we've also had explosion of digital assistants, autonomous vehicles, uh, AI being everywhere. In addition to kind of the broader history of machine learning, I also wanted to talk about some of my personal history. I got into machine learning first in 2007 uh, through my first uh, machine learning internship. Uh, this was at the University of Oklahoma. I, after my freshman year, I, I had applied for a research experience for undergraduates. And I initially got rejected, but then because I was the only person with uh, computer programming experience, I was, uh, my, my application was selected by uh, Dr. Amy McGovern, shown right here, uh, to work on a summer internship doing machine learning for storm type classification. So we we're trying to predict whether a storm would be uh, uh, a, a uh, isolated pulse storm or a, or, or a linear storm. Uh, and so, so we, I spent a, a summer doing clustering and decision trees on, on a bunch of storm data. Uh, here, 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 here's my computer setup at the time. Uh, and this, this experience really got me hooked on, on doing machine learning and I kind of kept working at it and Dr. McGovern kept me around uh, after that for, for quite some time. I ended up becoming her master's student and then her PhD student and now I'm still collaborating with her even though even after even now that I'm at NCAR. So, so it, it was the kind of happenstance but it led to a very fruitful collaboration and kind of change the direction of everything I uh, like I, I wasn't really thinking about machine learning before this but then uh, the summer internship kind of changed everything. Uh, the other major catalyst in my machine learning interest was in, in 2008 I attended my first uh, AMS AI conference. Uh, at the time it was a fairly uh, small group we had about uh, 32 presentations that year uh, and thanks to support from Dr. McGovern, I, I was able to keep returning year after year. And there I met a lot of other mentors. Uh, they're a really tight-knit group in, in the machine learning community, uh, especially well, the people in this picture, like uh, John Williams and uh, Sue Ellen Hopped and Philippe Tissot and Vladimir Krasnopolsky. Uh, and a lot of these people I ended up working with in one form or another. Uh, 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 John uh, and Sue both brought me to NCAR for my first uh, uh, NCAR visit, and then Sue became my one of my postdoc advisors. Uh, so, so kind of the, the networking aspect was was really crucial, in, in kind of seeing the broader array of machine learning research. Uh, and and for a long time, we were we were kind of discussing among ourselves. We we think machine learning is really awesome. Why isn't anyone listening to us? We're uh, but then uh, around 2017, uh, so I got my PhD around 2016, uh, suddenly people started listening to us and people started showing up and submitting talks and uh, we quickly grew from about 30 talks to this past year having almost 200. Uh, and, and the interest in machine learning in the atmospheric sciences shows no sign of abating. There's, there's not just this conference, but there's also many other ones that have sprung up. We had in 2011, we had the climate informatics workshop. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, we had the first NOAA AI workshop. And, and now there, there's 
so many AI workshops, I, 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 I have I've been losing count. Uh, in addition, uh, to start my NCAR connection in 2014 through 2015, I spent a year at NCAR through the ASB Graduate Visitor Program. Uh, here's a picture of me uh, uh, not working at NCAR, but at Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, so we do in fact uh, ha have fun in between doing all the machine learning, but uh, this kind of broadened my horizons beyond just doing machine learning for severe weather forecasting. I, I, I did during my time here. I worked on machine learning for solar energy forecasting. Uh, NCAR has a really strong track record in, in machine learning for a lot of different applications, but uh, wind and solar energy were one of the the real big success stories of the two, 2010s. Uh, we worked with Excel Energy to uh, develop a machine learning forecast system for them that uh, saved their customers a lot of money and helped uh, Excel justify building a lot more wind, wind power in the state of Colorado. Uh, and we've been developing more uh, solar systems. And this is an example showing how, how, how we, we could do uh, solar energy prediction in Oklahoma. Uh, and now we're doing solar energy prediction in places like Kuwait, uh, where there's a, a big ongoing project with them. So, so that was a bit of history of like my both the broader machine learning journey and my personal machine learning journey. Uh, now I kind of want to talk about machine learning in the context of weather forecasting. Uh, so first, uh, traditionally weather forecasting is done uh, by capturing a lot of observations from satellites, uh, ground stations, balloons, airplanes, boats. Uh, and we feed them all into our, our big computer models. So, so these, are, these are all physical equations that we run forward in time, out most days and weeks. Uh, and we run mul multiple versions of these uh, to see all the different weather scenarios that might occur. Uh, then we send all this data into our uh, weather forecast offices where our, our human forecasters have to process all of this data uh, in order to make their forecasts. The challenge they're running into is that there is so much data now that it can be hard to find all the relevant patterns in the short time they have to make a forecast. So that's where uh, AI can step in. AI can also, AI machine learning can also uh, look at all the observations and all the, the model output and feed it in, uh, summarize it, uh, correct errors in it, and both feed that to the forecasters or also just directly output its own forecast through th through things like the Weather Channel app or, or other um, application systems. Uh, ideally, the, the, the forecasters can add a lot of, still add a lot of value on top of the AI systems. And the, I, I see the AI systems as, uh, and most importantly, providing guidance for the forecasters to to enhance their ability to find patterns and, and find other things. Uh, but there's also room for AI to to produce its own forecasts and and help uh, serve serve people in cases where where the forecasters uh, like you want more quicker updates or, or or other things. The sometimes the, you can buy a, you can use more of the AI and. and uh, less forecasting, but uh, in general, I, I think it's uh, we get our best results when when all of these systems combine work together to to provide a real a strong calibrated forecast that's targeted to the needs of our users. Uh, for our first weather um, example, I wanted to focus on hail prediction. Uh, for a lot of our Colorado viewers, uh, hail has been a major hazard in in your life uh, for the past few years. Uh, most notably, in, in May 8th, 2017, there was a $2.3 billion uh, hailstorm that hit uh, Golden in West Denver uh, that that uh, shut down uh, a mall out there for about six months, uh, destroyed a lot of cars and houses, uh, and what was, I believe, Colorado's costliest weather event in history. Uh, a more example closer to, to home for, for NCAR, this is the parking lot of the NCAR Foothills Lab. Uh, this was a lot of small hail, but it was so much that it flooded the parking lot. Uh, so hail can cause hazards in numerous ways. Uh, if you want to get large hail, how, how does this happen? Uh, first, you need a thunderstorm, uh, preferably a supercell thunderstorm. Uh, 
if you want to grow hail, you need some hail embryos and you need to basically really small hail, like kind of really small proto hailstones. And you grow and you send them into your storm's strong, wide, rotating updraft. And then along the way, they pick up super cool liquid water uh, and grow and grow and grow until they become very large. Uh, once they become so large that they can't be held up anymore, they fall down. Uh, and in the process, if you want the hail to be large at the surface, uh, for meteorological purposes, of course, uh, you want your melting layer to be close to the ground. Uh, so ba basically, the, the cooler it is, the, the, the less the hail will melt before it reaches the surface. And also, if it's drier, that, that can also help. Uh, so if, if everything comes together, you can get really large hail. The problem, the challenge in forecasting hail is that a lot of things have to come together at once in the right place. And that makes it very uncertain and very challenging. Uh, but where machine learning can come in is, is that it can look at all these factors and weigh them together and look at different situations and, and find uh, where hail might be more prevalent. Uh, I also, at this point, want to acknowledge that this work has been funded by the National Science Foundation and NOAA in collaboration with, with my colleagues at the University of Oklahoma and NCAR, uh, and they're all listed down here. So, uh, so this is, uh, see throughout, and if I haven't emphasized already, this is a team effort that to build these kind of machine learning systems that requires uh, input from, from a really diverse array of experts. Uh, the first machine learning technique I want to talk about is something called a decision tree. Uh, it's one of the simplest uh, machine learning techniques, but also very powerful. Uh, a decision tree uh, is essentially what it what is called. It's a, a a a kind of a flow chart. So you start with a decision node, which has just has a question in it. In this case, the question is: uh, Is the wind difference with height greater than 15? Uh, if yes, then you go down the yes branch. If no, you go down the no branch. Uh, and then that takes you to another decision node. Uh, and you follow that one way or another. And this, this can go for, for quite some ways. Uh, but eventually you'll reach a leaf node uh, where, where the actual uh, outcome is determined. Uh, in this case, if we go down these two yes branches, we get a 76% chance of large hail. Uh, this is calculated by sending a lot of data through this decision tree and seeing, based off of the data that ends up down here, how many of those uh, examples or cases uh, produce hail, large hail, versus how many didn't. And that allows you to calculate a probability. You could also calculate like the size of the hail by averaging the sizes of the, of the hail examples that made it to that particular node. Uh, so, so decision trees are very flexible. Uh, they're also very interpretable because you can uh, see, you can basically read the entire model out from the screen. It's just these, all these questions. So you can make rules out of it. Uh, so, so the question is, how do you actually get all these questions? How do you grow the decision tree? Uh, first, you need a bunch of data. So we have our, our data example here from the Storm Prediction Center sounding analog retrieval system. Uh, which has a slightly unfortunate acronym these days, uh, SARS. Uh, but uh, it's a very useful data set in terms of seeing if you have small hail versus really big hail, uh, two inches being like something that will damage your, your roof uh, pr pretty effectively. Uh, the, the, the first step you, 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 you want to do is look through all the possible questions that you could ask about your data. And, and this involves going through your input variables, such as storm potential energy and wind difference with height, and trying every single threshold and saying, is the wind difference with height greater than 10? Is it greater than 20? Is it greater than 30? Is it greater than 40? Uh, and with each question, you, you check uh, how good is that question at, at uh, splitting the data into more similar subsets. Uh, eventually, you pick the, the, the threshold, in this case 15, that best splits the data. And then that allows you to, to uh, make, make the first leaf nodes of your tree. Uh, and once you do this, you, you have a question that causes the largest reduction in prediction error. Uh, you repeat the process. It's kind of a brute force search that you repeat on each subset of the data. And as you do so, we, we start finding more splitting thresholds that break up your, your big area into smaller and smaller subsets that are more concentrated and more exact. 
So we start seeing a pattern here where with small storm potential energy and small wind difference with height, we generally have small hail. And if you have large of both, uh, you tend to get large hail, but in between, uh, it's a little bit more uncertain. Uh, I should, before I go on, uh, one of the, the challenges associated with decision trees is that uh, while they are very simple and very interpretable, uh, they are often not very accurate because uh, like the they they can only make do these kind of simple splits um, and while you can do a lot of them it's uh, it's sort of limit you 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 run you can run into problems where it sort of makes no, noisy subsets that have very few examples in them um, and it's often not the most ideal model for everything uh, but decision trees in, in, in a group uh, can, can be very powerful if you, if you treat them in a special way. So the, the approach that often gets used in place of a single decision tree is something called a random forest. A random forest is an ensemble of randomized decision trees. So it, it, the reason why they're randomized is if you took the same data and put it through the tree growing algorithm, you would get the same tree every time. Uh, so if you want diversity in your decision trees, you, you need to randomize the, the training process. And the first step of that is you resampling the training data. So this means you put it all in a hat, you draw your, all your training examples out of the hat again. Um, but, but every time you draw, you also you put them back in so you can, it's called resampling with replacement. Uh, and in the process, some examples will get repeated multiple times and some examples won't appear at all. But doing this um, allows you to get a, a basically a, a more varied training data set. Um, you also want to grow your trees uh, with a search through the random subset of the inputs at each branch instead of all of the inputs. This speeds up the training process and it also uh, makes the trees more varied. Uh, and if you have a lot of input variables, this can also uh, be useful at, at, at making your tree more robust so that it, it, it searches a, not just the strongest features, but maybe the second strongest, it will pick up on those. And that, and that strength will, will add to the diversity. Uh, once you have grown a bunch of decision trees, you average them together and get a prediction that's guaranteed to be on average better than any of the predictions from the individual trees and better than the single decision tree prediction. Uh, these models are often what I call the second best model for machine learning on, on most problems because they don't require a lot of tuning. They're very robust to, to noise and uh, they're, they're fairly compact. Uh, they're, fairly, they're still fairly interpretable. Uh, they have a lot of great properties, so they're commonly used for a lot of uh, more traditional machine learning problems. So what does it look like when you go from a decision tree to a random forest? Uh, well, we take our decision tree here, uh, and then we, we replace it with the, we average a bunch of trees together, and we get something that looks a bit smoother. It still has some of the jaggediness uh, associated with the single decision tree, but we can see some of the areas where, where there's a little bit more uncertainty and, and it has more of a smooth gradient um, in, in certain directions in, instead of this sharp jump in, in probability at a certain point. How have I used decision trees in practice to, to do uh, machine learning? Uh, for this example, we're going to use machine learning for hail prediction. We start off with a numerical weather prediction model. So, so this is one with solving the physical equations of, of the atmosphere. Uh, we're in particular using something called a convection allowing numerical model, which allows is, has high enough resolution, which means the, the, the grid cells are small enough to capture individual storms. Uh, so uh, we run an ensemble of these, so a, a whole bunch of them uh, with different initial conditions. Uh, we extract all the storms uh, from this up updraft speed field. So we're looking for, for the strong updrafts because those are the best candidates for, for, for uh, hail. Uh, we also can buy information about their environment, like the temperature, uh, the, how the wind changes with height, uh, how the temperature changes with height, what the moisture looks like, uh, all the ingredients that one might need for hail. Uh, we match them with radar estimated hail sizes, so we know where the hail actually occurred. And now we have the inputs and the outputs for our machine learning model. So we train our random forest to predict hail occurrence, whether or not uh, one of these hail swaths will occur with one of these uh, updraft swaths. Uh, and then we also predict how big the hail is going to be, which is called a size distribution. Uh, 
we combine all these all this information together and we and they use that to generate both uh, swaths of, of hail size as well as probabilities. So on this day we had some uh, uh, the green areas show where there's a greater than two inch hail predicted. Uh, the kind of contour show the, the probability of hail over a 25, uh, let's say 40 kilometer area, 25 mile area. Uh, and uh, we can see that this lines up pretty well with where the large hail actually occurred. So this is, uh, so, so we consider this a pretty good forecast. Obviously there, there were some false alarms. The, the, the storm model predicted hail where it, um, in Texas where no hail was observed, but the environment was still favorable in that area. So, so there was some reason to believe hail might happen. Uh, the algorithm is also good at filtering out areas where uh, the model may have had storms that were something that was slightly favorable for hail, but uh, no, no hail occurred. And by reducing these false alarms, uh, this is where the machine learning model can be useful and it can help forecasters uh, zero in on the main threat areas and, well in advance. So this is, this is a forecast that was run like a day before the hail actually occurred. So, so we can kind of help nail down those areas and there's even some signal of predictability well in advance and that's really exciting. Uh, we're, we're currently in the, we've been testing this out, running it in real time for the past couple of years. Uh, one thing we found is that by adding an additional calibration step, so trying, by calibrating, we mean trying to make the probabilities more in line with what, what the forecaster would expect. Uh, we find that in combining this with the machine learning model, uh, we can get uh, performance in terms of something called the Breyer skill score, which is a me measure of probability uh, like how good a probability forecast is, uh, that we're, we're close to that of the human forecasters. So if the human forecasters use our product, they could be even better. Uh, it, it, that, that is our hope with deploying these kinds of systems. Uh, so that, that was kind of an introduction to hail, hail storms. Now I'm gonna sort of shift focus a little bit to deep learning. Um, Random forests are good and all, but they they don't necessarily work great on on every on, on every problem, and they, they can only take in certain kinds of data. So there are, there are a lot of other machine learning techniques that 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 have other advantages associated with them. One of them is something called a neural network, uh, or uh, an artificial neural network. The artificial part is in contrast to a uh, a biological neural network, aka your brain. Uh, but the, the connection beyond there is, is, is fairly loose, I should say. Uh, an artificial neural network uh, basically consists of a series of layers. Uh, you have an input layer where you feed in all of your data. You have a series of hidden layers. Uh, the hidden layers transform your data from its original form into a form that's more amenable to solving the problem that is, that is at the output layer. So, so basically, if you're taking like temperatures and you want to get hail or the intensity of a hurricane, um, you would stack a bunch of hidden layers together and they would uh, mix and match different different features together and and make something that that looks that that, that could e more easily tell the the large hail and the small hail apart. Uh, there's a bunch of circles in these layers and each circle represents an artificial neuron, uh, sometimes called a perceptron. Uh, each neuron consists of a series of weights or kind of number, an up, updatable number that indicates the importance of a single input. So you multiply the weight by the input value uh, and then you sum them together. So you, you have a, what's called a, like a linear regression inside, inside the, the body of your artificial neuron. Uh, then the what makes this uh, special is that we we add some nonlinearity to it. We we apply another function called the activation function. Uh, this can act as a switch to turn on and off the value. So if if this sum is negative, it'll set it can set it to zero, and if it's positive, it'll let it on through. Uh, and, and in doing so, we can we can then weight different neurons together. Uh, uh, and and come up with different representations of all kinds of uh, functions and and things from everything from a single number to an image to a time series. Uh, so it's a very flexible kind of framework. Uh, one thing that uh, traditional neural networks do is they they connect all. Basically, they have weights. For, uh, if you have a neuron in one layer, it will have connections to all the neurons in the previous layer. 
Uh, so this adds a lot of flexibility, but it also makes for make, makes it possible for the neural network to do something called overfitting. Uh, this is where it learn it fits the data it's seen too well. It, it gets too close to it. It's too it's too perfect, and it does so by fitting to noise. It, it will like just assume that that everything should be like this exact example. Uh, but really, in life, there's a certain amount of uh, smoothness uh, things we can't explain. So we don't want our, our models to overfit. We want them to 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 fit well enough, but not but kind of capture the main structure. Uh, so uh, I, uh, with that, we we can also see that uh, the, how it how it makes the structure also differs from a random forest because it has a set of continue a set of continuous functions that it's adding together. Uh, you get a smoother uh, surface compared with the random forest or the decision tree, which are which are still much more jaggedy. Uh, the random forest also does not extrapolate, uh, or ex it basically doesn't assume any values greater than what it has seen before. Whereas with the neural network, it can uh, extrapolate patterns beyond where the data original, like the bounds of the data originally lie. Uh, the more traditional neural network setup where you connect all the nodes together works really well for tabular data, but it works less well for things like images where you have a, basically each pixel of the image is, is an input into the neural network. Uh, but because we know like in our, in our images and our say weather data, there are certain patterns that we know has some kind of spatial structure to them that, 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 they, that, that occur in a certain location, but not all over the map. Uh, so if we assume that our the thing we're looking for is localized, uh, and that, we're, that the thing can occur anywhere in in our image, uh, we can adjust how our weights are set up so that they they form into this little box, uh, which we call a convolution filter. Uh, the idea of this is that we run the filter over the box, we multiply it by our image, where when you multiply and sum it together, if the values are high, that means the filter lines up with whatever's in the image. So it's saying, hey, there's something here that you should look at. And where it's low, it's saying, no, you shouldn't look here for, the, for this thing. Uh, another key part of, of our neural networks for images is doing something called pooling. So if we want to run the same size filter over a larger part of the image, we can either make the filter bigger or we can make the image smaller. And we do this by just taking the maximum in the given area. So, so in doing so, it's, you, you can make a, a smaller model uh, like with fewer weights that you have to learn, uh, fewer th like in less com computational complexity, so so less computer cycles, uh, by making your images smaller, and you you still retain a lot of the important information in doing so. When you combine these two pieces together, you get something called a convolutional neural network. Uh, in our weather example, we can take a, a radar image, something like you'd see on TV when, when there's a tornado or a hailstorm coming. Uh, we then feed it through a set of convolutional filters. We have multiple ones because they're all looking for different features. Uh, some of them will look for where the storm is. Some of them will look for where the storm is not. Uh, and some will, will be kind of redundant, but they will all look for different aspects of the storm. Uh, and we can then stack, like we take that first set of convolutional filters, we do a set of pooling on it. Uh, we then take a, a second set of convolutional filters and they will actually combine all of these previous images together and look for combinations of, of, of features. Uh, so we get we call higher level features or more complex features uh, in a, like an image, uh, like a, like a object recognition kind of context, you'd look for like circles or, or diagonals at this level. But then when you get to the, the deeper layers, you're looking for faces and wheels and airplanes uh, and other high level concepts. So here we may be looking for a supercell thunderstorm versus a squall line, uh, for instance. Uh, and then for our given problem, we, at the end, we actually have the part that predicts the hail. Uh, in this case, it predicts like, where where is the hail, like these the notices the features at the edge of the storm are are positively associated with with the storm producing hail. And in this case, it gave the storm a 98% chance of hail. Uh, so from this, we can do uh, hurricane intensity forecasting. Uh, this is an application we can use with uh, with, with uh, deep learning. Uh, in, in this case, uh, 
why do we care about hurricane intensity forecasting? Well, intensity is defined as the maximum wind speed of a hurricane. Intensity depends more on small scale forces, so it is harder to predict than the track of the hurricane, which is like which way the hurricane is going. Uh, in this case, uh, our, our hurricane intensity forecasting errors have, have decreased over time, but they have not decreased as fast as our track errors. So, so it's an open problem. How best can we improve our intensity forecast? And because there are so many potential features to, to look at, machine learning offers a way to, to help us uh, narrow down that search. Uh, for, for this particular problem, uh, we, we used um, uh, data from the hurricane weather research and forecasting model. So this is a numerical model, numerical weather model that is designed specifically to forecast hurricanes. So it's centered on the on the storm and it follows the storm as it goes through the 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 the, the ocean on and onto land. Uh, here's all the tracks of all the storms in our model. Uh, we use three years of model forecast to train the model, and then we have a separate testing set because we want to make sure. Uh, the, the hurricane model performs well in storms it hasn't seen. We tested in 2018 uh, with 18 storms from, from this data set. Uh, we're trying to predict the change in the wind speed in 24 hours, uh, and we're really interested in what's called rapid intensification, which is when storms would, uh, like, basically the, the wind speed goes up really fast. Uh, this is a problem when, like, if you're going to evacuate and or not evacuate, and if the storm looks weak, uh, and then you decide to stay home, and then suddenly it's a Category Five monster the next day, then then you have lost 24 hours of preparation. So uh, this is a this is a big problem. Uh, we use two methods. We use a random forest and give it a bunch of features that describe the storm. And then we get, use convolutional neural networks, but we only give it images, uh, basically images of different weather fields at different levels. So it has a 3D picture of the storm uh, to, to look for patterns in that. Uh, what we find is that uh, both machine learning models do, do really well, especially at longer lead times. So in this case, lower error is better. So this is mean absolute error uh, of our intensity forecast. And this is the lead time in hours uh, ahead of, of when the forecast is valid. Uh, the, the red line is the original h warth prediction of, of, of the change in wind speed. So both machine learning models seem to find features. Uh, the convolutional the neural network does it a little bit better at some times, and the random forest is better at others. Uh, so in this case, deep learning wasn't so, so, like a lot better than the, it wasn't really better at all than the random forest, but it can look at different kinds of features uh, and potentially help us identify things in space that may be important and maybe things we need to look more at uh, as researchers uh, and identify further. Uh, so, so next I want to talk about some machine learning challenges. So, so we show a couple of examples of where machine learning can, can be very effective, uh, but there's also a lot of outstanding issues that, that face the machine learning community today that we, we still need to re resolve. Uh, one is called is extrapolation. Uh, machine learning works really well when you have a lot of data points in a given area. Uh, it's easy to interpolate and, and, and see the changes in behavior when you have data around it that, that kind of constrains things. But when you don't have any data, uh, the assumptions of your machine learning model become a lot more important uh, because it hasn't seen that area before and it, it could perform well uh, if, it's, if it, the assumptions are good, but it can perform very badly if the assumptions are not good. Uh, there's also the problem of distribution shift. Uh, this is the kind of more technical term for everything suddenly changes uh, about your your world, and and now all the assumptions don't the data you had don't apply anymore. Uh, we've all seen this uh, in the past few months with the with the COVID pandemic. Uh, here's an example of toilet paper. That's the store predicted that that we only need so much toilet paper based off of Pre, before COVID, but then after COVID, everyone stayed home and needed a lot more toilet paper. So all the machine learning models were now invalid, and that kind of that was this kind of systemic failure uh, has led to some of the supply shortages we're, we're seeing. Uh, machine learning can also run to the problem of over optimization. So you have one metric that like error, like you want to make the most accurate machine learning model possible, or you want to say maximize one kind of metric of like uh, uh, engagement and YouTube videos, for instance. Uh, 
the problem is often we, we need to care about a lot of different factors. And if we only focus on one thing, then we can get lead, lead into some very, say, deviant behavior by the machine learning models. Uh, it could recommend, say, more extreme videos uh, uh, compared to the one you're initially watching, but on the same topic. And that can lead to people getting, say, radicalized uh, by watching a series of YouTube videos. And there, there's an article about this in the New York Times in 2018, and been a number of other books and articles since then that, that, that have brought this issue to light. Uh, so, so there are ways to, to train with multiple goals in mind, and, and, and that can help uh, address some of these issues of, of over-optimization. Uh, there's also the problem of underrepresentation bias. Uh, this has been talked about a lot more, especially in the past couple months. Uh, but uh, machine learning models learn from their from the data they're given, uh, and if the data contains, uh, like, say, say there are not enough uh, women or or underrepresented minorities in in the data set, then the, the model will perform worse on the on, on, for for those people in comparison with with the the majority of people it has been trained on. Uh, it can result in in outcomes like this image here, where the model is trying to take a blurry face and enhance it, sort of like what you'd see. Uh, on a TV show. Uh, in this case, it took a picture of Barack Obama and turned it into a, uh, a white guy. Uh, and, and this is because this model was trained on a lot of pictures of primarily uh, white celebrities. Uh, so so these, these kind of issues and how we build our training data sets and, and how we uh, like weigh different groups in our training and evaluation process uh, make a big impact on, on how good our machine learning model is. This comes back to that well-defined problem I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, if we don't have a well-defined problem and a good, good ways to evaluate it, to check for these kinds of issues, then we'll end up with uh, some really bad outcomes. Uh, this is not a problem uh, that, that this is also a problem that the weather community needs to worry about in the climate community. And uh, because our data sets also contain different kinds of uh, biases due to their, how we collected the data. For hail, uh, we often collect hail, hail reports by asking people to compare the hailstone with common objects like baseballs and teacups and softballs and grapefruits and marbles and half dollars. Uh, as a result, uh, we get certain objects that are more common or overrepresented in our hail size distributions. Uh, and, and where we don't have an object, we don't have hail sizes there. And this, so this affects our view of what the hail sizes look like. We also don't collect hail reports from everywhere. We only collect it where there are people. Uh, so you can, in the hail databases, you can see things like cities and roads and, and farms and, and, other, and other things that, that aren't entirely randomly distributed like you might, might expect a, a storm to be. Uh, we also see this in other weather instruments. Uh, so this is an example of weather underground personal weather stations. Uh, here's an example of one here. Uh, these are like a, like a $500 to $1,000 equipment that you put on your house uh, and you can send the data to Weather Underground and they will uh, broadcast it to the world and archive it for you. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice feature, but it requires a lot of initial investment to set up. Um, the advantage of this is we get a good local view of where we have these stations. The problem is these stations are not equally equitably distributed. Uh, if we look at Longmont, which is where I live, uh, uh, this is a map from the US Census and the Washington Post that shows the, the red dots are where uh, white people uh, live. And then the, the yellow dots in, in this case are, are where uh, Latinx uh, people live. Uh, and if we look at the relative distribution, uh, we, we see that there are far fewer weather stations in, in the areas that are have a larger population of underrepresented minorities because, and this is due to some historical issues. Uh, and, you, and you see this pattern in other cities as well. Uh, recognizing this, if we want to get more equitable representations of our weather data, one thing we could do is, is work on making lower cost weather instruments that we can distribute or make available in these areas so that uh, people can provide weather data and get better weather forecasts for their area that are more calibrated to, to, to their particular areas. Uh, so there's a problem, but there are, are potential solutions we can build on from this. 
uh, to further analyze and evaluate some of these issues, we can also use uh, techniques in the area of explainable machine learning. This is an area I've been working in for, for a little while now and is an area of great interest and uh, has a lot of potential for development. The idea behind this is that our machine learning models uh, generate predictions, but we often don't want just the prediction. We also want to know about why the machine learning model made a prediction. So we can use techniques like partial dependence plots. Uh, this, the idea behind this is that we, we take, all, like, take all of our data, uh, say temperature, uh, we set all of our temperatures to the same value. We send this data through the machine learning model. We take the mean prediction of it uh, and we repeat this process for, through, for a bunch of different temperatures uh, where, where the line in this, in this partial dependence plot is, is, is flat, uh, there's little sensitivity to this particular, to temperature for predicting, say, hailstorms. Uh, but then when, when there's a sharp change in the line, that means the prediction is changing as a result. Uh, for hurricane intensity, we find that things like the maximum wind speed from, from the weather model, uh, if it's increasing, uh, then, then the uh, change in intensity is increasing. So that's kind of a sanity check. Uh, we also see for minimum pressure, which is highly related to it, you, you see that if the pressure is increasing, the storm is gonna weaken. If the pressure is decreasing, the storm is gonna strengthen. So again, another sanity check. But we can look at also things like wind shear. If the wind shear is decreasing, the storm is strengthening. If the wind shear is increasing, the storm is more likely to weaken, but only uh, for a certain range of values. So this is this is information that can that can help us check if the machine learning model is learning the right thing, but it can also reveal uh, maybe other variables that might be important and and might have some other sensitivities. So so it's a way to reduce the complexity down quite a bit. We can also interpret our deep learning models, which are a lot more complex, but have some we can we can simplify the process by looking at, at what it's learning just in the input space. So we do this by taking our image, we feed it through our trained neural network, and we compare what it predicts with what we a desired label. So if we wanna see where, what it should look at to make a big hailstorm, we, we send the data through, and then we, we, we send the signal backwards to the input, and we come up with this heat map that will actually say, like, you should increase the reflectivity here to make a stronger hailstorm or decrease it here to make a stronger hailstorm. Uh, and this can identify regions of interest. It can also, if you run it multiple times, you can actually build a synthetic storm uh, from just what the neural network learned. And here's an example of one. We can see things like uh, where the, the temperature and, and uh, moisture is high uh, near the surface, that tells us that uh, uh, it's an increased chance of hail. We see things like directional wind shear with height, uh, which is the cha change in wind with height. And we see things like the change in temperature with height is also really important. Um, we can do also do this for different parts of the neural network. And in the process reveal that the neural network learns, different ki learns about different kinds of storms like supercells, bow echoes, pole storms. Uh, and each of these has a different chance of hail and occurs in different parts of the country. So we can use this to analyze our large data sets and reveal climatological patterns like supercells tend to, uh, that produce hail tend to occur in the Southern Plains, whereas the bow echo storms tend to occur more in the, say the Midwest or upper the Northern Plains. Uh, and the pole storms that produce hail only tend to occur say in Florida or in Arkansas. Uh, so, so we can use this uh, for climatological analysis. We can use this for individual predictions. Uh, it has a lot of potential that I'm working with uh, other scientists at NCAR and uh, other universities to, to really examine in more detail. Uh, finally, I wanna show another example from Hurricane Michael, which uh, hit the Gulf, uh, the, the Florida Panhandle as a category five uh, uh, back in 2018. Uh, the contours show where the neural network is focusing its attention in terms of trying to make a prediction of increasing or decreasing intensity. Uh, so it's looking at the wind field as it evolves uh, and, the, and the different contours kind of highlight the areas. You'll notice most of them are in the core of the storm. So it's focusing on where the scientists would expect the most important information is, but it occasionally also looks at say the outer regions of the storm. So maybe that's providing some hint as to some other factor that we should, we should further investigate. So in summary, machine learning sorts through large complex data to find key patterns. Uh, combining with physical weather models, we can improve our weather forecasts and provide better guidance to our forecasters. And we can use explainable machine learning and deep learning to guide our forecasters and researchers to potential features of importance. 
So uh, thank you for listening. And now we'll take questions from the Slido. Uh, if you have any other questions after this that we didn't get, I didn't get to on the Slido, please feel free to reach out to me at my email or Twitter. So I'll turn it back over to Lorena now. Awesome. That was amazing. I know you just did a one week workshop all about machine learning and it was five days and it was many people giving presentations. So it's really great that you were able to do a one hour summary of it all. So thank you so much because there's a lot out there um, and it's really amazing to see how everything continues to evolve from 1950 until now. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been quite, um, yeah, there's been a lot of developments and it just feels like things are kind of accelerating in, in this time with more and more people getting into machine learning and deploying on a broader array of problems. Uh, this is just kind of a, a, a small sampling of, of, of what, what machine learning can do. And I, I hope it uh, excites people to learn more. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, the workshop is called the AI for Earth System Science Summer School. Uh, if you Google AI for ESS, uh, you'll you'll find our website. We we've also posted all the videos on the uh, the Sizzle NCAR YouTube page. If you want to go learn learn a lot more, we even have a hackathon with data sets out there, so you can try the machine learning yourself. Uh, That's so awesome. And one of our questions, because it seems like there's are, there are a lot of people that are interested in this. Um, Daniel, can you put up the first uh, question about drawing a general path and advice? So the question is from David P. And it'll pop up on the screen. Um, and the first question was, could you draw some general path or advices? for starting at machine learning applied to weather prediction? And what are some common mistakes or misunderstandings? Okay, uh, thank, thank you for, for this question, David. Uh, my, my uh, let, me, let me think through this really fast. I would say that my, my biggest advice is start simple. Uh, it's just, with all the really complex machine learning models being being uh, hyped out there. Uh, recently, there is a machine learning model release that has 600 billion uh, weights uh, inside the model. Uh, this is for like natural language processing. Uh, you might think that you need a massive supercomputer uh, or, or or multiple massive supercomputers to to get started, but really like, you can you can do machine learning on your laptop. Uh, there's a lot of smaller data sets available. Uh, so one place to start, uh, the AI for System Science Summer School, we have some hackathon problems on there. I've also put together hackathons or like short courses on, on AI for um, uh, as part of the American Meteorological Society uh, annual meeting. There's, we've done an AI short course the past two years. It's been sold out each year. Uh, and so we're, we're planning to do another one, which will probably be virtual, but uh, that, that might mean you have a chance to do it. Uh, I, I encourage you to check out those data. There's publicly available. We have we have Jupyter notebooks. So so it's a for those who are not familiar with them, it, it, it's a kind of web visualization tool where you can like write Python code and run it and make plots and it's very interactive. Uh, so so that some of those are a good place to start. Uh, a lot of people sometimes will also use like Kaggle competition. So Kaggle is a is a uh, website for machine learning competitions. They have some kind of tutorial machine learning problems on there to kind of just get started. Uh, that, that for general machine learning, it's a good place to see what other people are doing and download some real data and try it out. Uh, in general, you might want to find a problem you're also just in, really interested in and kind of work at it. Try download some basic machine learning libraries like scikit-learn and try out a linear regression, then try a random forest, and then maybe a neural network uh, and see how, see how they work. Uh, some, some common mistakes and I think misunderstandings. One is making, is that some people don't understand the difference between a training set and a test set. Uh, 
a training set uh, is the, the data you actually use to, to update your machine learning model and, and have it learn, whereas the test set should be independent. It shouldn't, it should be data the machine learning model hasn't seen before or isn't like anything the machine learning model has seen before. Uh, so when you're evaluating your model, you want to use the test set to make sure that you're, you're, you're uh, like not overestimating your, your performance. That's a common mistake people make. Um, trying to think, yeah. So there's a lot of other ones, uh, but, but I think those are some resources to get started and uh, that's something you'll run into. And if you also look at things like the AMS AI conference, we have all of our talks online. It's also a good place to see lots of examples of how people are doing AI for weather and climate. So I encourage you to, to, to look those up as well. That's such great advice. Thank you. And it's great to hear that there are so many resources out there for everybody to try things out. Um, Thank you. Should we go ahead and go to the next question, Dan? Um, it was upvoted and the question will pop up again on the screen for everybody to have access to it. And it asks, um, how can we use machine learning to categorize extreme weather events? Well, so that's a, that's a, that's a good question. There, there's a lot of different ways to do, I think, categorization. Uh, one, one way is to is using machine learning to look at, uh, say, uh, images of like say satellite data or weather models or climate models, and identify things like uh, weather fronts and uh, hurricanes and other tropical cyclones uh, and atmospheric rivers. Uh, anything that's kind of a more of a blobby shape. Uh, you can use uh, more traditional expert system approaches or fancy deep learning approaches to do this. Uh, but the, the, the general idea is that y you can look through this complex grid of data and find the main features you're looking for. Uh, and then you can do lots of statistics on those features and see like, where are they occurring? How are they, how, how is, uh, like, how, how are the properties of them changing with time? So, so like, climate change is a, is, is a thing we're really concerned about, and extreme weather associated with climate change is still an area of active research with a lot of uncertainties associated with it. Uh, but one thing we can do to estimate some of those uncertainties is use th these kind of uh, extreme weather segmentation algorithms. We apply them to our, our weather and climate model output, and then we can see how, like, are the number of hur hurricanes in our climate model increasing or decreasing, or that uh, how, how are snowstorms changing as an example? There, there, there is a, there's some research by Collins or Zicky that, that worked on that. Uh, there's a group at uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab, uh, uh, Prabhat and uh, Kartha Kashinath, uh, among others, uh, who are, who've been working on kind of the deep learning for extreme weather for a while, as well as a group at uh, NOAA uh, Earth, Earth System Research Lab with uh, Jeb Stewart, uh, uh, yeah, Christina Kumbler, uh, that they're also been, been working on this on uh, satellite data. So, so there's there's a lot of groups that are working in this area that are really interested in it that that are doing some great research. Uh, so I encourage you to 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 check out what they've been doing. That's awesome because there was there had been a question about how it relates to climate. So it's great to see that you're using um, severe weather like big storm impacts and using that moving forward. So our, um, Dan, can you show us the next question, please? Yeah, in the process, I, sh I should also acknowledge my, my postdoc, Maria Molina is also currently working on, on looking at uh, extreme weather looking, uh, uh, and, and how, how it changes with climate change and how deep learning can help predict that. So I encourage you to, to check out some of her presentations that uh, she should be publishing more on this soon too. That's awesome. Thank you for letting us know about Maria Molina and her work with you on this. The question that we have is, what is the most surprising thing that you've learned about working with machine learning? Uh, that, that's a really, that's a really tough one. Um, I, I think the most surprising thing, uh, one that you don't expect is that it's it's really hard to get a slight improvement in your machine learning model performance, and it's really easy to make things a lot worse. 
uh, there's a lot of different settings that you can change in your models and and it's always tempting to just keep let's do one more tweak one more run uh, and sometimes you every once in a while you find the right thing that, that makes a, a pretty big difference uh, but often the biggest the things that make the biggest difference are cleaning your data doing good exploratory data analysis working with experts in the field who are who know a lot about the problem and help like define it for you in the way that helps them the most and makes it like makes the solution more obvious uh, uh, so uh, so i think in, in, in the like those are some of the like kind of hardest learned lessons uh, going through the machine learning process it, it takes a lot of work and it, it also takes a lot of human effort in in the machine learning process while we talk about a lot of the computers and automation uh, people, there's a lot of people who have to work on this to, to build the, this infrastructure. Uh, and yeah, the, the, like it's a, that's, that's why I think no one, like people think machine learning, in some ways machine learning can take people's jobs because it's automating certain kinds of jobs away, but it, the whole machine learning infrastructure requires so many people that it's also creating a lot of new jobs, including my current position in the in the process. Yeah, so it's definitely leading to um, kind of our next question. Um, Dan, if you can post up the next question, please. And the question is mostly about model complexity versus accuracy. So can you discuss your thinking on the model complexity versus accuracy trade-off in your machine learning work? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so this is again where where the importance of having a good test set and good evaluation systems is is pretty crucial. Uh, model complexity can be useful in terms of allowing you to have a richer representation of your data uh, inside the model, uh, especially if you're using things like image data or anything really complex. Uh, if you use a less complex model, you you won't be able to uh, take advantage of all the information there. But sometimes with more complex inputs comes a lot of noise and that's where extra complexity can, can sometimes be a problem, especially if you only, if you have a limited data set, which in cases of extreme weather or, or like climate data, we, we often don't have a lot of, uh, of unique examples. Uh, so, so it's important, I think, to start with a less complex model and then test additional complexity and kind of an iterative process and make sure you're actually adding value over your simpler model. Uh, and sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, and it's hard to say a priori, so you have to, you, ha you have to, that's why we do the research, why we, why we, why really good, important, good evaluation and testing and, and good problem definition is important for this. Thank you. And our next question is about CS, which is um, computer simulations. Uh, or com computer science, I, I computer think. Computer science. So both computer science and atmospheric science are important to your work, but which field do you need a more in-depth understanding of? Well, that, that's, a, that's a tricky one. Um, I, like my, by training, I am a I'm a meteorologist, atmospheric scientist. But along the way, I I, I took a lot of computer science courses, uh, especially in machine learning and AI and visual analytics. Uh, and kind of some of these different areas that that are important for building good machine learning systems. Uh, I I would say uh, like to be effective, uh, you, you really need to know. Uh, I think it helps to have a fair bit of understanding of both. Uh, it's hard to become a yeah, like a, a top expert in both areas, but if you can learn this at least enough to speak the language of the domain you're working in and understand the problems of it, uh, then then you can. I think you're more effective at solving it rather than just being completely an atmospheric science expert or completely a computer science expert. Uh, so learning. Uh, I think having a strong foothold on one side or the other, plus enough uh, 
language and interdisciplinary communication experience to be able to talk to say experts and and on the on the other side can really it can get you a long way um, and some of it also depends on what like what aspect of the machine learning uh process are you are you most interested in working in if you're doing like kind of theoretical algorithm design then yes you're going to need a lot of computer science knowledge and experience in mathematics to to be able to work in that area uh if you're doing more say applying existing machine learning models to 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 problems you like it may be more important to to basically it helps to know how the models work but you don't need to necessarily know all of the the like proofs and fundamental math behind it, but you should at least have some idea of how it works uh, and how where, where it works well and where it doesn't so that you can uh, apply it well within your atmospheric science problem. That's awesome. And I'm sure that's also comes into play with collaborations where you might not be the expert on one part, but you have a collaborator who might focus more on that other aspect that you're exactly. also interested in. Exactly. I, I work with a lot of different collaborators because even within atmospheric science, there are so many different sub areas that that are uh, like have their own specialized language. So like the, the, the severe storms experts and the hurricane experts are like two com very different communities that even though they're both meteorologists, they they have different models they use and different terminology and different priorities. So, so even doing that little, that relatively little jump uh, is, is like walking into a different world, much less like I work with atmosphere chemists and haven't had a, a chemistry class since high school. So, so that was a, a definitely much, I had to rely much more on my uh, uh, atmosphere chemistry collaborators to, to, to help guide the way. That's so awesome. Sweet, let's go ahead and take the next um, question. What is the first thing that you suggest to students who want to learn and apply machine learning to atmospheric science? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think the that's uh, that's uh, that is a that is a good question. Uh, I I would say try to uh, do some reading uh, about about machine learning and uh, and kind of see what's what's already been done out there. Um, I made a lot of recommendations about uh, like the the AI summer school, the AI short courses, the AMS AI conference. Uh, I'm a co-author on a, a, a bulletin of the American Meteorological Society paper that was led by uh, Dr. Amy McGovern uh, that kind of provided a lot of summary examples of machine learning and, and for weather prediction uh, that's been uh, like well, well read. And that, I think that's a, another good starting point to kind of see what machine learning can do uh, and ex explain some of the algorithms and how they work. We, we also have a follow-up paper that talks about some of the interpretability techniques that just came out last December. So both of those I think are good resources to, 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 to look at as a, as a starting place. Um, I, I think uh, like try, yeah, get, get your hands dirty, like actually get some, get some data and try out some basic machine learning models, whether it be in scikit-learn or the, the first machine learning program I used is something called Weka, which is, which is still around and it's a, a Java uh, GUI. So it's like just a point and click machine learning program. So you can load in some data and you can click random forest and click the train button and it'll like, it'll run and, and spit out some numbers. So uh, you don't have to know any programming to get it to work. So, so, so you could use something like that even to, if you really want to get started with something basic. And it has a whole bunch of different machine learning algorithms in it to, to try out. Uh, there's also a lot of other like more like user-friendly interfaces that, uh, that different people have built for machine learning now. Uh, like TensorFlow JavaScript ha has, some, has some nice demos, for instance. And you also mentioned that as a student, you did an internship, the research experience for undergraduates. So I think that might also be kind of a nice way to get your hands involved in seeing whether or not you like machine learning 
in atmospheric sciences and NCAR does have, um, they're currently doing an internship program. They're midway through the program for the computation information systems laboratory, the SciParks program, and there's Unidata. So NCAR does also have opportunities. Um, the application is open in the fall. So if there are any students or if you know any students that are interested in this type of work, um, definitely apply in the fall. Yes, yeah, I highly encourage you to to apply for for those programs. They they they, I I did RE, the REU and and the Hollings program, uh, and both of those like had a big impact on my research career. Uh, I'm currently mentoring a Sci Park student, uh, and plan to mentor more in the future. So so you might have the, if you want to have a chance to potentially work with me, uh, uh, encourage you to apply. Uh, we also have the, the SOARS program, which is, which is targeted at uh, more, I think more underrepresented students in, in the atmospheric sciences uh, and provides a lot of really good mentorship. And I've, I've also served as a SOARS co-mentor before. Uh, so, so I, yeah, encourage you to apply for those. There are REU programs also all over the country in all kinds of different areas. Uh, probably quite a few on machine learning now, maybe not necessarily for weather, but some are for, yeah, definitely some for weather, but but there's a, like, if you want to do machine learning in some fashion, you could probably find an internship program for that right now. There's also lots of boot camps and other ki kinds of short courses uh, if you're, if, if you want to go that route. Uh, it's a good skill to have, but there, I, I should also say that machine learning isn't everything. There's a lot of other really important skills to have out there. Um, uh, things like say communication skills, uh, being able to translate the machine learning models into useful decisions is a really, really important task. And, and we, we need people who are not just programmers, but also uh, can under, like, understand the, the social dimensions of these problems. Uh, so, and we, we have colleagues at, uh, 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 colleagues in car like Rebecca Morris and Julia DeMuth who are, who, who are really interested in, in, in these kind of challenges with communicating uh, forecasts to extreme weather. Uh, and uh, so, so the, with, with we, we like, we kind of, we need people that they can, there's a lot of ways you could just say use machine learning, but not necessarily work with the, the algorithms directly, but work with how they impact people. Uh, and I think that's, it's a really important area. Uh, and it's going to, it's already a hot topic and is a growing area of importance. And to do that well, we need social scientists and business people and, uh, and a diverse array of expertise to, brought to bear to, to make head, uh, headway on these problems. That's awesome. And we are getting close to 8.30 p.m. Um, mountain time. So a couple of, um, we have a couple of other questions that we might not get to, but one of the things that keeps coming up is that uncertainty in um, the input that you're putting in. So one question that I had seen was, you know, determining what aspects are like, for example, there was a question about a convolution filter. Um, and how to d determine like which filters you're gonna use and how does that affect the results? So it's a lot of questions that are talking about the input affecting the output. And you briefly did mention it in your talk about you know, this human error that you're putting in, but can you speak a little bit more to that? Uh, yes, uh, so, so how, how, how do you yeah, pick your inputs and how, how, how does the machine learning model pick the inputs? I think is, is some of this, uh, some of it is, is, on, on, is on the end of the human designer of the system. Uh, basically often you're, you, you could like pick a kitchen sinks worth of inputs. So you could try everything under the sun, but in you're, you're likely to run into some inputs that are, will be, uh, right, like correlated, but not in a causal way. So, so like uh, vocabulary and shoe size, or shark attacks and ice cream sales, or, or, or uh, <laughs> because they both happen in the summer. Um, as a the uh, so just because there's a there there may be a correlation, but not all of them are, are causal. And, uh, anyway. Uh, like working with experts to figure out like a reasonable set of, of inputs as a starting point. Uh, then in the machine learning training process, the like with the convolution filters and uh, 
like the 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 numbers in that filter are actually updated by the the uh, the the automatically by the training process. So they they start out as random. They're, they're they don't they're just like you just give them random values. And then as you show more and more examples, uh, the neural network will change those weights a little bit every time it sees a different example. And and uh, as it sees more and more examples that push the weights in one direction or another, uh, those little random perturbations will lead to one filter doing one thing and another filter doing another thing. Sometimes they're kind of they end up with some redundant filters, so they like multiple filters will find the same a similar thing. Uh, but if you have enough of them, that's that's less of a problem. Um, with decision trees, they, they do kind of do a brute force search, but they will still pick them what they think are the most important features and ignore the ones that are not important. So the so a decision tree in a random forest can be more robust to noisy or bad features. A neural network less so, but you, you there's other ways you, you can pretest the, the quality of your features or, or do other filtering beforehand to, to help with that. Yeah, and then in your talk, you also did mention that you, you still go back to those um, observations. So you had a graph of like um, max wind pressure, wind shear, and if your model doesn't really match what you're expecting, then you know something kind of went wrong. So it's good exactly. that you have those checks. Yeah, that, that's where the explainable machine learning kind of techniques are, are really helpful is they, they can act as a sanity check and uh, you can get something called the uh, clever Hans effect uh, is based off of this horse that seemed like it, it learned language, but really it was just uh, responding to, I think, how, how its trainer was was reacting and, and doing certain actions based off of what the trainer was doing. Uh, so you, so there's way, uh, so there's also examples of where like a cat and dog detector uh, was really accurate at predicting cats and dogs on one data set, but it turned out it was only because all the pictures of dogs had like a blue blanket in it, uh, and all the pictures of cats didn't have a blue blanket. So it wasn't uh, being able to use explainable machine learning can help like identify those kinds of situations. Great. Well, thank you so much, David John, for all the work that you've been sharing with us. And maybe in the future, we can do an encore to this lecture where we can just kind of sit down for half an hour and continue to take more questions with you. So we'll talk more um, opportunities like that. And for everybody who has been watching, thank you so much for participating in our polls, questions, and asking your own questions. Our next event will come out on our Explorer Series website. And on our Explorer Series website, you can also sign up for our mailing list if you'd like to get email updates on what's happening next. So thank you everybody on the call and thank you David John once again for being our speaker for tonight. I look forward yep. to, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I look forward to that. I'd uh, be, be happy to answer more questions in the future. Thank you very much, Lorena. Thank you, uh, Brett and Daniel and Aaliyah. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Hope you have a great night. Thank you, everybody.